Okay, great. Um, well, again, it was a fantastic, uh, fantastic uh, first session with with wonderful speakers and a, a lot to think about. You know, I, at first I thought I just wasn't going to sleep because of sort of worrying about you know AMR and and environmental toxicants. Now, anybody in the room who's still thinking about reproducing probably thinks differently after hearing Rodney Dittert's <laughs> speech and what can happen to you en route to actually having a baby. And so. Um, it'll be interesting to see if there's a drop in the birth rate in the cohort in this room afterwards. Um, so, um, so we have some discussion questions to sort of kick off here. Although I actually have, I, it's, you know, I have others that have come into my head uh, actually after having listened to all of this this morning. But um, I'm going to I'm going to start with one that I don't think we sort of covered, even though some of us are infectious disease people by training, but. What are the most pressing problems in infectious disease globally for which environmental factors play a role? So we sort of talked about it from one side, but you know, there are some, there's a lot of major investments out there in controlling infectious diseases. And, and for which of those do we think that environmental factors play a role and for which we probably have in, in some ways under addressed that? So I wanna start off with that question. So Linda, go ahead, please. Since I'm the newbie on this panel, um, <laughs> Um, I, I think air pollution is clearly a major contributor, um, both in its suppression of the immune response in the lungs um, and the inability to fight off or the reduced ability to respond to different kinds of infectious agents. I think the issue that we are just beginning to look at of drinking water contamination and um, by, for example, pesticides and runoff, I thought, you know, the whole issue of fecal contamination in drinking water or groundwater sources is huge, but I think the, the, the pesticide issue, the humongous use, I was very glad to hear about the talk about the overuse of antibiotics, although for the first time this year in veterinary antibiotics, the um, use actually decreased in this country because I think FDA has changed some of its requirements, and so that, that was potentially helpful. Um, I was really glad to hear talk about phage because I think it's really important for us to understand that, um, you know, for every bacteria, there is a bacteriophage and phage phage. And the point is, is that th there have been approaches in the past, and, and the Russians have been working at this for quite a while. You might say they're doing some other things too. But certainly as far as, as the bacteriophage, they're looking at that as an alternative to antibiotic use, um, which I think is certainly... So I'm not trying to answer your question, but I would clearly say that there's no question that air pollution, nine million people are, are die every year from um, air pollution. At least four million are, are related to um, indoor smoke or indoor household air pollution. And the majority of those are, are young children. And it's due to respiratory infection, especially in pneumonia. So, so that's great. And then maybe if, if someone's willing to sort of answer the question from the other direction. So that's sort of where we really think that We've really, you know, we've, we've not paid enough global attention. We're not getting enough global attention to a problem that we think has huge implications for infectious disease. But where are we investing large amounts in infectious disease where we've under-recognized and are under-acting upon the environmental contributors to that infectious disease? Sort of the question from, from the other side. Well, uh, one gap, I don't know about the size of the investment, but sitting in central New York, we've watched the Lyme epidemic move up. The interesting thing about that is clearly things have changed. Now, they may have changed at several levels relative to agent, relative to the vectors, but environmental changes too presumably have gone into some of this. <clears throat> My concern is what happens to those individuals that are bitten by a tick. Now, because Cipro is usually prescribed, you, you have a preventative because of the potential side effects, neurological and otherwise, from Lyme. But, so you're administering antibiotics to that population, leaving them then open for subsequent potential infections that can arise because you've depleted the microbiome in a, in a fairly broad spectrum way without necessarily doing anything to replenish it. Um, at the same time, Lyme is very serious for the side effects. So that's just one example where I think we're reactive 
were not, to my knowledge, proactive. I'd be very interested if other people had information about <clears throat> the underlying cause of the, the spread and impact. But I think it's a very serious situation where you have uh, literally anyone with a tick bite could well wind up on antibiotics. Can I just comment on that? You're talking about Lyme disease. We know that, or I think we believe that much of the increased Lyme disease is related to, for example, deer population, which are now, because all their homes have been cut down, they're basically coming into more inhabited areas. And the, the span, as I showed on that slide, is increasing work. But it's not only Lyme disease. There's this new, in quotes, tick-borne disease, which is related to eating of mammalian protein. And it has exploded. And I don't think anyone really knows why. It's a different tick species. But I don't think anyone really, and it's, it's not something that can be treated by antibiotic use. Um, I mean, it, it puts people into anaphylactic shock, and they've just got to totally avoid any mammalian protein from that point on, and I don't think anyone knows anything about that. Uh, yeah, let me just jump in here. Um, so um, with climate change, we are seeing a, a spreading of these uh, arthropod-borne diseases uh, and increasing use of pesticides or um, anti-insect chemicals to... Our, our general approach to arthropod-borne diseases is to kill the, kill the insects. Um, and, and I think of pesticides kind of like antibiotics. Um, they're kind of a one-size-fits-all. You kill them all. Um, we're, we're just trying to kill the bugs. But, but the problem is the insects are often the linchpin of ecosystems. They are important food sources for many animals, birds that we rely on. Um, and, and our widespread use of these chemicals not only hurts our health, <clears throat> but it hurts the ecosystems of the planet. And we are now seeing reports of a plummeting population of insects, the insect apocalypse, if you will. It was uh, in the New York Times Magazine. And we really have to start thinking more strategically about how to live in our buggy world, whether it's microbial, whether it's arthropods. We can't just keep killing them um, indiscriminately. We really need to start thinking more targeted, whether it's phage therapy with the microbes, or we've got to be more strategic with the with the insects and not just kill them all off because it's going to ultimately hurt not only ourselves, um, but uh, much of life, the, you know, the other uh, creatures on the planet. So I was, I was at this meeting. Um, I was one of the few non-entomologists, and it was one of the most eye-opening meetings that I had ever attended. Um, and, and they really want to be part of the discussion but they're generally not included, the entomologists. Um, but there's a lot of interest in using um, CRISPR or gene drive as a strategy to address some of these uh, insect populations in a more targeted way. But of course, then you've got to deal with the political opposition of using genetically modified organisms to try to um, you know, target the deleterious insects, if you will. I mean, nobody really likes mosquitoes, although they certainly are an important food source for, for bats and other creatures. So um, we really need to get the entomologists, I think, on board in these discussions rather than, I mean, from a One Health perspective, the people who are experts in the insects really need to uh, be at the table. Good change gears a little bit and, and sort of steer us back to what is the main sort of point of our, of our workshop over these two days, which is how can environmental and infectious disease scientists maximate, maximize processes to facilitate collaboration? And so I wonder if, if any of you have some thoughts on what are the key opportunities and some of the challenges to breaking down these interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary challenges. You know, how do we take this, you know, we heard dis different pieces of the puzzle, but in many ways, how do we bring, how do we start to bring those, those scientists together? It's a theme we're going to go back to this afternoon and tomorrow, but, but want to actually offer this panel the opportunity to reflect on that. 
I think that in terms of, it starts with education, and I think being able to inform and educate, not only at the post-secondary level, but also in secondary school. The pipeline we know exists well before university, so if we're going to get people interested in universities to be able to take the academic training, I think we have to start earlier than that. I think we need to get into high schools about inform integrating into curricula what we're talking about in these important issues of environmental health, one health, and planetary health. That'll get kids excited about that. There's some really interesting opportunities for academia to be able to engage with universities, particularly those in low-income settings. Being able to find ways in which master's and PhD students can go in to low-income communities and schools to show children the opportunities and possibilities of where their lives could take. The other area with it is in uh, outside veterinary sciences to be able to uh, involve and integrate planetary one health and environmental health, as I mentioned, both in the biomedical areas as well as in the non-biomedical sciences. Um, I think one of the challenges that we found is being able to, uh, I mean, the public health folks, you all know, the challenge we've had in being able to increase public health training in non-public health streams in academia. And so at CUGH, we're really trying uh, hard to be able to do that. And finally, I think, you know, the, I think the wonderful thing about what we do is that we have incredible stories to tell, powerful stories to tell, sexy stories to tell. And for you know, those of you who are working, right, I just got back from Quito, Ecuador a couple of days ago. We we're working to bring together Latin American institutions. The Yasuni is an area that, those of you know, is one of the most biodiverse, remarkable places in the world. Those of our colleagues who are working there, if you're able to capture what they're doing in real time or be able to describe what they're doing, not only in prose, but important in the powerful visual means that we have to tell the stories, to communicate them well in an exciting way so that they appeal not only to this, but more importantly to the heart, those kind of things, we know we have to elicit an, an, an emotional response for things to stick, right? Neuroscience tells us that. We have the material, we have the people, we have the knowledge, and we have the places and the tools to do that. So I think one of the things collectively I think we can do is learn from those people who communicate powerfully and well to tell our stories in a way that elicits those responses, informs, and compels people to action, not only amongst policymakers, but more importantly, even in the public because the public moves the political. Great. Uh, Linda. So I just want to respond to Keith and, and make a couple of comments in, in two points. One is starting at high school to educate um, kids related to the importance of One Health and what we're talking about is too late. Um, we really need to start earlier. Um, in fact, it would be better if we can start by about fourth, third or fourth grade, get the kids excited then about the importance of environmental health, for example. Um, but certainly by middle school. Um, all of our environmental health core centers and our Superfund centers and our health disparity centers, et cetera, all have um, community engagement cores because you've got to get the community engaged in order to do things related to environmental health and clearly related to infectious disease, I would think, as well. And many of them have programs for young kids. And I would urge people, if you're interested in, in thinking about uh, communication opportunities and doing it in a way of telling stories to look at our website and some of the um, materials that have been developed, especially by some of our tribal partners, which are very, very powerful, and some of our others we've done a lot with our breast cancer and the environment research program. Um, they are developing communication that actually grab people as opposed to being all, you know, nice and um, didactic being actually drawing out emotions um, to, to make people who are not scientists get involved. So I think there are terms. And I, I'm really not here to talk about our strategic plan, but we have a major effort here in terms of developing stories and the importance for scientists to be able to tell stories. Believe me, if you're testifying on the Hill or even to staffers, you've got to put it in ways that will grab people. If I could add to that, I, I think I absolutely agree. It's really important to reach students early. I had a chance through a group called Beyonder Academy connected to 
Buffalo State University that, that mainly deals with uh, elementary, some middle school students. And we did a, developed a workshop called Adaptable Me, a half-day workshop that was really to take them through a whole variety of exercises, some physical, some creative, some a little bit of didactic lecture. But it was really geared with the idea that they have ancient bacteria and archaea that are scattered throughout the globe that are in their gut. And it's related to, you know, archaea that are in the Yellowstone geyser and the Dead Sea and glaciers underneath Antarctic ice and, and the like. And it, but it was done as sort of a mystery discovery thing where they didn't have, they got clues, they did things, and finally, in the end, figured out it was about part of what's in them that's also around the globe. And that kind of, just to see what happened with those students, and of course I was had the privilege of working with educators who work with that group of students to do creative things all the time. So all I had, I had the easy job, just some content mainly, but uh, it, that that is really quite remarkable. And I think it it's something that'll stay with those students as they go on. Uh, the idea that as they protect themselves, they can protect the earth too. Yeah. So the um, the National Science Teachers Association, together with the National Research Council and other partners, developed the Next Generation Science Standards, which is a core curriculum, was based on a work done by the National Research Council to improve STEM education in K through 12. Uh, and part of the whole thrust between the behind the Next Generation Science Standards is um, interdisciplinary. Uh, work, uh, recognizing that there are subjects in science that are really transdisciplinary. Um, so um, um, a colleague of mine and I, uh, Dr. Cheryl Stroud at the One Health Commission, we assembled a team to develop case studies, One Health case studies, uh, on um, four uh, grades in the elementary school, middle school, and high school. I took on the high school. And last July, we presented our case studies to the National Science Teachers Association STEM Expo and Forum in Philadelphia. It was well received, and I think there's, there'd be a lot more interest um, in, developing, in developing One Health themed teaching modules for students um, that the teachers can implement. But it's not an easy thing to do, and I think the more input that we can get um, from people from their own perspectives in science, looking at it in a broad base, developing um, teaching materials for the science teachers to use in their classrooms, I think would be a really beneficial thing to do. And they have NSTA meetings all year long, so um, please check out their website and maybe submit a proposal to, uh, to um, present at one of their sessions, I think. The more people engaged in that, the better. Great, thanks. I'm going to ask another question of the panel, but at the same time, I'm going to look out to the audience here. If you've got a question you'd like to, uh, to ask, there are microphones at the wings. Go ahead and queue up. I'll ask a question now so there's not a gap for those waiting on the audience. So go ahead and queue up now. And after I ask this question, we will open it up to, to folks to, to ask other questions. So, I want to sort of bring us back, you know, we are a, a collection of scientists here in the room. We're going to talk about sort of, uh, this is around emerging science. So are there emerging changes in science or advances in science in, in recent years that you think can facilitate the sort of collaboration, the, the interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary work we're all striving towards, the interplay that's in the title of this workshop? So are there, are there uh, what, what would any of you say are sort of hopeful advances in science that will facilitate that. Since I didn't prepare for this at all, it's good. <laughs> go ahead, I, go I ahead, think, Linda. I, I think one of the things is big data and the ability to, first of all, the push to make data fully available, and then the tremendous amounts of different kind of data that can now be looked at or theoretically can now be looked at, and people are working to bring it together and look for opportunities there. I think that is one of the biggest things, biggest advances that is that is still ongoing. You know, and also I think that the communication tools we have now, which we could never have imagined, our little cell phones, our phones that we have here are actually, as we know, 
has more computing power than the first um, uh, ships that went into space, which is remarkable that we have it in our pocket, right? But that makes us all have an ability to democratize the knowledge that exists. So I think that's certainly a, an incredibly powerful tool we all have. Rodney, you had something. Well, Linda had my idea, which was big data. <laughs> big data. I, I think you're already seeing the benefit of that tremendous opportunities. And so they're, they're the next stage is really envisioning exactly where we can apply that. I think we've only, it's just the tip of the iceberg so far. So it's a matter of, okay, if you have that capacity to collect and potentially apply those data, then what people can you put together to do so in a way that we, you know, we've just barely started with that. And so uh, that's, that's going to advance things tremendously if we can just get the right people together. Yep. Yeah. I think the growing recognition that we live in a microbial world and we are essentially microbial supraorganisms, uh, recognizing that and um, an increasingly um, better ability to understand the biome of the planet, um, technologies such as metagenomics, we've not been able to grow a lot of soil microbes in the lab the ability to just extract DNA directly from the environment to see what's out there. And I think if we include geologists and um, climate scientists to understand how the climate is now impacting the microbial world around us, um, to um, better understand the interactions between, for example, the bacteria and the, the viruses, the phages, um, understanding the dynamic nature of our microbial world and how it impacts us. I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg on that, but um, I think it's a really exciting road ahead. Great, great comments. I'm going to turn it to the audience. We've got uh, seven people queued up. I don't know that we'll have time for everyone. But let's see if you can keep your questions uh, short and directed. That'll give us the best chance. I'm going to start over here on my left. Okay. Uh, and let's... Yes. Hi, this is Fana Soyer, and I liked um, the previous uh, comments to the questions about starting early with um, education about all these concepts, but that's also banking on that that generation is going to solve our problem. And so I have a two-pronged uh, question. One, what is the urgency of these pr um, of these issues, and what are strategies to address these now so that our future generation that we are educating won't land up in a world where this is too late for them? That's my question, so I'm going to... <laughs> <laughs> It's good when two people have the same question. It means it's probably on the minds of many people. It's a great question, and I look forward to our uh, panelists having a response. Rodney, please go ahead. Well, um... That, that's a great question, and, and I'm very much opinionated on this, so keep in mind it's just my opinion. It's not Cornell's. It's not NAS. It's not, um, we are on the verge of being too late because you saw, even with non-communicable diseases, the statistics, 70, uh, 70 to um, more percent global mortality, not just in developed worlds already. And the important thing is we are not leading some of the decades of life of that 70% mortality that's NCDs, we're not leading that in a healthy way. We're leading it with cumulative increased numbers per individual of NCDs and medications that go with that, each one with an array of side effects, so that you're literally dependent upon the next doctor's office visit and picking up the next prescription. And I have a family member at one point that was taking 21 pills a day. Now, tell me that that is a good strategy. And yet, if we only treat presenting symptoms, if that's what the clinician treats is today's presenting symptoms, then that's not lifetime planning. And we know the course in terms of risk of infectious and non-communicable diseases if we do nothing different. So I can tell you that I've already I gave a lecture in DC at HESI in this, this past summer where I basically said, if a physician prescribes antibiotics, unless it's extremely narrow, the physician has killed a part of that person's body that the physician did not intend to kill. Put it back. So that's an indication of why I think, yes, we got to do stuff now. We don't know everything that we need to know, but we know enough to do some useful things. And, and no longer can we degrade our own bodies without making those conscious decisions. 
um, and not do something about it. We need, we can, and we can lead a healthier life, and we can enjoy the decades of life of our long life. Yeah. And need need probably a lower level of caregiver status. We're running out of caregivers. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, on the right. Uh, we, oh, do you wanna do you wanna add to that, or should we? Okay, so Margaret, go ahead. Melissa Perry, George Washington um, University. Melissa, sorry. Uh, I think that this question actually is a add-on to the question that was just asked. It's um, maybe framed a bit more negatively, but it's not intended to be. It is in, uh, intended to focus on obstacles. So if you could wave a magic wand and in five, or I'll be more generous, ten years, um, and hone in on one obstacle that you see us encountering, whether or not it's being political will, funding, the ability for scientists and policymakers to communicate with each other, the ability for scientists to communicate across uh, disciplines, whatever that might be that you think needs to be addressed in order to not pass these problems on to the next generation, what would it be? Great question. Uh, Keith and then Laura. So if I may quote uh, William Fagy when he was asked what was the biggest challenge in terms of improving health. He said it's management. Management. So if we don't have the public institutional structures that can actually use, utilize the wonderful research that's being produced, that we match the, the zeal for the production of knowledge with its translation, that we have the public institutions across not only health but the other ones I mentioned in terms of finance, the environment, public works, justice, et cetera, then we cannot sustainably implement the research that's produced, the evidence-based solutions that will address the environmental health uh, uh, challenges that we face today. That is the biggest challenge we have. And, and finally, and this is great, we were talking about this at the break, there's a real deep need, there's a deep need to be able to, in professional schools, to be able to integrate some management training into that. Mm -hmm. The American Association of Medical Colleges had, about two years ago, an interesting editorial about that, saying, you know, we although our, our curricula is jammed in, in medical school, mm. we need to be able to provide that kind of management training into medical schools. But I would, I would extend that to just about any professional discipline. Before turning to Laura, I'm just going to comment on that. I, um, uh, to me, this is very powerful. I actually direct a leadership and management initiative in global health because I actually came to believe that that is the missing ingredient, that we have invested so much in new tools, billions and billions of dollars, and new diagnostics, drugs, vaccines, data, and precious little than the human capacity of people who are responsible for delivering those innovations on the ground. Um, so I really, I'm, I'm very happy to hear you say that. And I, I think that this is something that we really do need to pay uh, more attention to. You know, if you look back, Sri Lanka, for instance, eliminated malaria in the face of civil war, no particularly new tools, not much in the way of ODA resources because it had committed leadership and meticulous management all the way from the top, all the way down to the bottom um, of the most peripheral village health worker. And so, you know, going back to those basics and really thinking about how we, how we do that, I think is something really, really important. L Laura, over to you. Yeah, I would just agree that political leadership is absolutely critical in making any kind of headway on some of these issues that are confronting us. Um, and also um, communication by the scientists. And just to give you an example, uh, climate change, which I think most people don't really understand other than just the weather is getting weird. But um, we, I think the general public has to understand that um, we've had agriculture and we've had civilization because the climate has allowed it. For the past 10,000 years, we've, had, we've been on this baseline of, uh, of, of our climate. And the only tiny deviations, the little ice age, was met with widespread famine and war. So de deviating off these, this baseline that we've been on for the past 10,000 years has been devastating for civilization. And now we've gone off the baseline by one degree. And it's only going to get worse. And do we really want to doom our descendants to a, a really bleak future? Um, I, I, for one, would like to leave our kids a, a habitable planet with uh, the ability to raise, grow food, um, we really need to convey that not only to the next generation but to our political leaders. It was, I thought, a real oversight by the mainstream media to not bring up climate change in any of the presidential debates 
and we absolutely have to hold them accountable for this next coming debate on to what is our next president going to do about it. All right, thank you. Back to my left uh, for another question. Uh, hi there, uh, my name is Dustin Hansen. Uh, not affiliated with anything. Um, but my question was, uh, to what degree do we compromise our own health um, in our search for sanitariness and cleanliness, both in our homes and just in our bodies through like showering and stuff like that? I mean, it seems like uh, we're, we're kind of getting rid of all the bacteria all the time that seems to be pretty important. So I was just wondering if anybody had any comments on that. Rodney. Yeah, very definitely. We've overreacted in a sense to the idea that, you know, microbes are a huge threat and we've got to be protected essentially against all microbes, which means that, you know, the, the best house is the almost sterilized house. But if we actually looked at decades of data, the germ-free mice, of course, they have to be given vitamin K because can't make it themselves, it's from the microbes. We, we need the microbes to actually survive and certainly to thrive. And as a result, while you don't want to put a child at risk for a life-threatening infection, um, quite frankly, a child that can go out and play in soil, uh, that can experience an animal farm or a petting zoo now and again, um, is likely to be a healthier child in the end. We know that those kind of environments <clears throat> enrich and help maintain a robust microbiome, and immune system profiles in turn reflect that. They go hand in hand. And so, again, we would be much better to, uh, you, you don't want to forsake technology and, and what we've developed, but you want the best of both worlds. We'd be much better to, to go around on, on some non-pesticide using animal farms once, once in a while uh, and uh, you know, and it, or, or let our dogs go and come back and play with us, you know. Uh, so, yes, and the urban area at the moment, the megacities, are really concern me, both for opportunities for infectious agent spread and the reduced host defenses that result from this being a microbial wasteland. So our defenses are going to be, we're going to be depleted, our defenses down. We think we're doing good. We can see a tree and we're eating a salad for lunch, but... Those that have mic microbiologists that have gone in and sampled our urban areas, again, have, have said it's a microbial wasteland. It is not something that will support us and help us thrive. So we, we really better act pretty fast on that. Thank you. Over to my right. So I'd like to build on the, the previous conversation about political will. So Abraham Lincoln said, With, without public opinion, nothing can fail, and or without public opinion, Nothing can fail with it. Nothing will succeed or vice versa. I think I got that wrong. But anyway, uh, you know what I meant. So in Dr. Martin's talk earlier, um, he talked a lot about we need to you know, frame this as a defense issue. And I worked for the Defense Department. That will only go so far. I mean you're right. It's just necessary but not sufficient. So I want to challenge all four of you. Um, you know, we're all scientists in this room or at least most of us are. Um, but to communicate this to the public, to get the public on board, politicians follow the public, not vice versa. Um, that's a full-time job. You are all at, you know, famous places. You need a, you need a communications team pushing your message. You can't do it at 11 o'clock at night when you're exhausted. And it's quite frankly, not your skill in uh, manipulating social media. So I would like to challenge, um, all four of you and, and other people in the room that that needs to be a bigger part of what we do, what we fund, um, et cetera, the comments. A lot of hands. So I'll, uh, I'll start just because Linda and then we're Laura. the funding agency. <laughs> here. Um, and we have major efforts not only in studying the science of communication, risk communication. Um, it is a science. There are ways to do it to get your message across and to get your message. You know, a message is not just the message delivered. It's also the message received. So you've got to look at that as well. Um, and we're trying very hard. I talked about our um, community engagement. Um, and those groups work very hard at getting the message out as well, as well as our scientists. I mean, I think I get very frustrated when I hear some of my folks say, oh, I don't want to have to talk to that reporter, or I don't want to, you know, have to communicate in some way like that. But we actually insist that all of our people take communications training and really work hard with many of them so that they can better communicate. Because if you don't don't get your message across. Why have you done what you've done? Laura. 
The, the beauty of social media is that you can get your message out directly to the public. Um, and I'm pretty active on Twitter. And we have a Facebook group, One Health Approaches, that I encourage everyone to join. It's a pretty active international group. And we're sharing articles all the time, lots of active discussions. The challenge with social media, though, is if I tweet something, I'll be lucky if I get one like or one retweet. That's about it. Um, the people who get the most retweets are usually people who will tweet something inflammatory. I mean, anger seems to propagate. You know, there's a reason why the shock jocks or whatever um, are so popular because they shock. But when you're trying to sell or teach about science, it doesn't have that level of impact. And the question is, how can we get it to have that level of impact to get the 20,000 retweets of, of, hey, this is what climate change means? You know, I, I had a whole tweet storm trying to get that message going, and it just didn't get picked up. And it was really frustrating. So, so the question is, you know, how do you get a public that's interested and engaged in science when it's just not, I guess, sexy or something? I, I really don't know. But I think that's a challenge that we all have to face uh, in trying to get the message of science out. I think, you know, one of the, when I used to, uh, when I was in Parliament, I used to have you know, folks come to my, groups, scientists come to my office, and they'd come along with a tome that was about an inch thick and say, here's what we want to do. I'm not going to read that. They said, well, give it to the minister. The minister's not going to read that. They said, well, the minister reads the Lancet. No, the Minister of Health doesn't read the Lancet. As remarkable and wonderful as that collection of journals are, they don't read that. So we've got to, I think, and we have to educate ourselves, I think, in terms of how to communicate, and you're absolutely right. That's a really interesting point that you made. You know, we're trained to be able to articulate things in a very logical way. That's going to often move nothing, right? And you've got to humanize the problem. Remember that, that unbelievably tragic picture in child who was two years old, face down on the sand, who was drowned in the Mediterranean? Thousands and thousands and thousands of people have drowned in the Mediterranean. You never saw anything about that or very little about it. That little boy, that picture, hit home. You've, we've got to find ways of, of connecting the, per, the people we're communicating with to what we're doing. So we've got to, we have to make it uh, personalized. You have to make it relatable. You have to be dealing with perhaps self-interest. Not always, but there are certain common the things that bind us together, of course, as humans, as we know. And I think that you're right. We can't all individually do this. But if we're all being able to use not only social media, but we still have to use traditional media. And we have to use different platforms. And it's, I think the visual is important and also the length of time. People's attention spans are six to seven seconds long. That's all you have. So that seven-second opportunity is what we need to do to be able to affect this more than this. And it's completely counterintuitive, of course, to our training, right? We're not trained to do that. But that means we have to, if we want to be able to breathe life into the work we're doing, as Linda mentioned, to be able to have an impact of the incredible investments in time and effort and talent and money that you have all done and others are doing, we've got to be able to go and affect the public and policymakers and learn the ways to do this and, and be willing to break eggs. We have to be willing to break eggs to do it, and it's hard to do that, which means you're going to be confronted by violent opposition. We have to be willing to take on that violent opposition and, and move through it. It's, it's counter, because you don't want to get it hit in the you know, chin, right? It's, but for the greater good, you've got to be willing to take it to be able to face the opposition and be willing to drive through it and use the research and evidence we have in our back pocket. So just a second, we have two and a half minutes left. So what I'm going to propose, picking up on the seven second theme, um, is actually, oh, now we have two people who are still waiting. So if you can pose a sort of 15 second question and we can get one of our panelists uh, for each of them to answer, then we can get two more questions in before our lunch break. So go ahead. 
Okay, given the barriers posed by the tragedy of the commons, that is, it will cost any individual player more to clean up his act than he will gain by doing so, we have to pursue policies. What policies? And shouldn't policy makers be part of this discussion? Okay, great question. Who wants to take that on? All right, Linda bravely raises her hand. 45 not, seconds. I am not a policymaker, at least not now. Um, but I think the point is, is policy can be driven by, um, by people action, and someone else talked about that. In other words, often policy is driven by, the, well, I'll say the masses or large number of people raising issues, and that's what leads to policy. And at this point in time, I can say we better do it in California because that's what's driving our national policy, too. In, in, individual, individual actions count, communities count. So the summation of individual actions that can improve our environment, we've, we, we've got to also utilize that as a tool. I just want to make one comment, and that is that outrage drives policy. When there's a crisis and there's enough public outrage, that drives policy. That's usually what will make uh, politicians pay attention. But to try and raise it to a level of outrage that gets to that is not easy to do without the crisis generating it. Okay, the last question. Okay, uh, Norb Comiskey, Michigan State University. So I'm, I was hoping to capitalize on two of our panelists, both Rod and Linda, uh, because you're both on the panel, and, and I'm going to change the topic a little bit to the environmental factors of xenobiotics. And, and Rod, you did a really excellent job driving home at least two themes for me. One was the importance of systems biology and how we think about these environmental factors. And then also that symbiotic relationship between the host and all these microorganisms. And what really struck me was that in our current kind of paradigm with toxicology, we are so so focused on, on moving away from animal studies, which I'm, I'm in favor of, and we're so much focused on, on doing in vitro studies with individual cells or cell populations. And I'm wondering, how are we, are we going to miss the, this important interaction between the microbiome, the microorganisms, and the host as we move to that paradigm? So I just, I, I, and, and are, can, are we doing things to capture this? Um, so maybe the two of you could just briefly comment on it. I appreciate it. Actually, that. I'm going to intervene and say the one of you can choose to comment because we're over. Okay. Um, so I'm going to overrule that suggestion. So either Rodney or Linda. So I think the, the issue is, is that the issue you raise is, is true of lots of things as we move to alternative test systems, which I don't think we're doing that rapidly in total. I think that we are, at this point, developing rapid high throughput computational methods and in vitro methods and so on, which may allow us then to use fewer animals and ask more in-depth kinds of questions. I think I share your concerns, as I always have with a lot of in vitro, because I look at like the endocrine system and say its whole point is integration, so how can you look at a single cell? And in many cases, we're moving away from using single cells to using organs on a chip. And there's nothing with an organ on a chip that would preclude the addition of microbes to that organ in a chip. One of the things we've talked about, bacteria, we've talked about viruses, we better remember that fungi are important too when we talk about the microbiome. Do you want, I'll allow one last comment. Here. <laughs> oh, uh, actually I just want to pick up on the fungi and make the point that if, if you doubt fungi are important, remember that, that plants use through their roots communication networks a fungi and plants at a distance will arm themselves against an aphid attack from one way over somewhere else that got attacked and sent out a signal, and they'll actually change their genes and start to arm themselves. So there are communi when you showed some of those global communication networks, I'm thinking, yeah, microbial and fungal, yeah. yeah. And, and we probably can tap those but haven't been doing it So in our awareness yet. Well... Thank you all. Thanks for a fabulous set of talks, a uh, fabulous set of, uh, of discussion, uh, the answers to the questions, and great uh, questions from the audience. And uh, if everyone can give a round of applause to the panel. Thank you.